Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to uh, present during this session on antimicrobials in the time of coronavirus. I thought what I would do would begin with a, just a few comments about the virus, since that's the uh, feature today. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. It's an RNA virus. Um, and in this uh, graphic depiction here, you'll see a long strand of RNA in the, in the uh, virus, and it's surrounded by a complex capsule. But there are a couple of things I want to point out about that capsule. And one is this lipid bilayer here. That uh, means it's made out of fat. And that becomes important when we think about the impact of soap and water on this virus. And then the spike protein, uh, which is the mechanism by which this virus uh, is able to enter cells once it gets into our body. And those, in this case, are typically in the uh, nose, throat, uh, and lungs. This virus is spread uh, predominantly through the air uh, in both large and small droplets through coughs, sneezes, and we're learning that even talking can uh, 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 expel small droplets that can travel some distance through the air. Um, those are called aerosols when they're really very tiny and they can go much farther than the few feet that we originally thought this virus could travel. Contaminated surfaces probably also play a role if these droplets fall onto chairs, tables, uh, beds, railings, and so on, and then uh, people touch those surfaces, that can be uh, an indirect method of exposure because then uh, your contaminated hand may be brought up to your face, uh, get it into your mouth, your nose, into your eyes, uh, and that's another route of exposure. And I think we still don't know how much contaminated surfaces contribute to the tr uh, transmission of this virus, although I think it's probably likely to be more important in some settings than in others. As we know, this is fairly contagious virus. It can be spread from a person who has no symptoms, which makes it particularly hazardous. Um, and uh, it's more deadly than seasonal influenza. So we're all taking it very, very seriously. And as we know, there's no vaccine yet. Uh, treatment is mostly supportive, although a num number of clinical trials of therapeutics are underway. Prevention uh, of this disease is really multifactorial, multidimensional, and uh, the setting helps to determine the uh, interventions that we're using. So in the hospital, for example, uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, which includes things like masks, respirators, gloves, gowns, face shields are all very important. Cleaning and disinfection plays an important role in trying to pre uh, prevent uh, this disease from being transmitted uh, to other people. And even building design and ventilation are now being used to try to keep uh, this airborne virus from getting out into other areas uh, of, of the hospital. If we think about the community setting, uh, we're all familiar with the social distancing or spatial separation that we've been asked to practice. Uh, and that's a very important uh, intervention and has had dramatic effects in many communities. We're also now being asked to wear masks and hand hygiene has been emphasized from the outset because of this indirect uh, transmission from surfaces to our mouth uh, and nose and eyes that I spoke about. We're, we're seeing many more people wear gloves now to, to try to keep their hands from being contaminated. Cleaning and disinfection plays a role and then testing and isolation of people who have the illness. In our homes, hand hygiene is critically important. Cleaning and disinfection plays an important role. And this becomes particularly challenging when someone in the home is infected and you know the virus is present in the home environment and now you're trying to keep it from uh, being transmitted to other people who are there. So let me just give a few uh, definitions to get us on the same page here before I uh, get into the whole issue of disinfection and antimicrobials. Uh, an antimicrobial is an agent that kills microorganisms or stops their growth. Cleaning is uh, the removal of visible soil from objects and surfaces, and it's usually accomplished manually or mechanically with water and soap or sometimes with enzymatic pro products. Uh, and soap is particularly important here because soap uh, 
actually disrupts that lipid envelope that I described on the outside of the SARS-CoV virus. And it's one of the reasons why soap and water uh, hand washing is so important and so effective in terms of getting the virus off of your hands. Disinfection is a process that eliminates many or all pathogenic microorganisms, except for some that are particularly resistant like bacterial spores that are lying in a dormant state, so to speak. And then sterilization, which is mostly confined to healthcare uh, settings, although also used in food preparation and some other uh, areas, is a process that destroys or eliminates all forms of microbial life carried out by physical or chemical methods. For example, high heat in a, in a, uh, um, uh, in a hospital or uh, very toxic chemicals that can be used to completely destroy all microbial life. Now, just to give you some idea of, of what we're facing here, this is just uh, an example of, of a few bacteria and one, and one set of viruses. Uh, the names aren't particularly important here, but this is how long they survive in the indoor environment on, on surfaces. And you can see it's quite variable uh, from months to days to hours. Uh, and some of them are extraordinarily uh, 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 able to really lengthen this depending on their ability to, to respond to certain environmental conditions. So some of them, for example, can last for 30 months or so. But now let's take a look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. And what do we know how long, about how long it can remain infectious in the indoor environment? And I'm stressing here infect, infectivity because the RNA can be picked up on a surface long after the virus has lost its inf infectious properties. So what we're really interested in is how long does this virus remain infectious before we need to stop, before we can stop worrying about it. And we have two papers that have been published uh, that I'm aware of, and I've given links to them and they're publicly available. So you can see them online. That's beginning to show us how long this virus remains infected on, uh, on various surfaces. You can see, for example, on copper, it loses its infectivity within about four hours, whereas uh, on glass and paper money, it can remain infectious to up to four days. Now, I want to emphasize that e on any of these surfaces, the infectivity begins to drop off fairly rapidly, quite quickly, but then it lingers for a while. So uh, this is when I say up to four days, even on glass and paper money, it begins to lose its infectivity long before that four day period. So now let's talk a little bit about disinfectants. And I want to uh, talk about disinfectants that uh, have been uh, considered to be effective against this particular virus. Uh, and one can find that list of disinfectants uh, at the EPA, EPA website, the Environmental Protection Agency website, at the uh, link that I've shown here. And in particular, there's an end list of products that uh, have all been uh, approved uh, as being effective against this virus. I want to emphasize, however, that before even thinking about disinfectants, we want to talk about cleaning first with soap and water. Uh, first of all, that helps to destroy the virus, and secondly, it makes the surface more readily available uh, to receive the disinfectant and makes the disinfectant more effective. These products all have very vari variable toxicity, and their so-called dwell time uh, is important to pay attention to. That's how long the product has to lay on the surface. Uh, in order to kill the virus, and it varies from one to another. So important for people to pay attention to that dwell time. Uh, in general, uh, I would recommend that, that uh, people who are using disinfectants try to avoid respiratory irritants and sensitizers. Those are uh, chemicals that can either cause or trigger asthma, trigger asthma attacks in people who have asthma. Um, they are things like quaternary ammonium compounds, and Anne is going to be talking about those, so I won't uh, go into that in any detail. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, or household bleach, is another uh, very effective uh, disinfectant, but it too is a respiratory irritant and can cause or trigger asthma, as well as being uh, irritating to the skin and to the eyes. So 
people using that, if they have to use it or choose to use it, should uh, use it in well-ventilated areas, wear rubber gloves, uh, and uh, try to avoid any skin contact. There are, however, however less toxic examples of uh, disinfectants that are effective against this virus, including hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, and citric acid. But it's important to pay attention to the compatibility with the surface that's to be disinfected, because some of these can be damaging to certain surfaces, like uh, fabric, uh, soft surfaces, uh, and, and so on. So it's important to consider that, and also important to follow directions, uh, because uh, uh, these can have variable toxicity, and they de definitely should not be mixed with one another. For example, if someone were to, were to add chlorine bleach to ammonia, there would be the liberation of a very toxic chlorine gas that is highly hazardous. So it's important not to just add these uh, together. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about this whole idea of putting antimicrobials into furnishings. Um, I'm referring here to a, a, a project that I did uh, along with other folks from Healthcare Without Harm several years ago, when we took a close look at this uh, practice of beginning to put more and more antimicrobials into hospital furnishings, saying things like tables, chairs, bed railings, bedding, uh, doorknobs, and so on, with a, with a question that we ask is, do they really help reduce healthcare uh, associated infections? Um, this report is publicly available online at the URL that I have shown here. Um, clearly, the causes of healthcare associated infections are multifactorial, and the interventions are multifactorial as well. And I think a lot of these lessons apply to the COVID-19 illness as well. The role of contaminated surfaces in hospitals has been well demonstrated, and it's one of the reasons why cleaning and disinfection of surfaces is undeniably important in hospitals and is a keystone of trying to prevent these healthcare associated infections. In this report, we summarized uh, uh, what we know uh, about antimicrobial coatings and surface technologies that are continually being developed and looked at their efficacy and what had been demonstrated or not demonstrated so far. We summarized some of the laboratory test methods that are used to evaluate bacterial loads on surfaces using these various technologies. But I want to emphasize that there really is a lack of standardized protocols for evaluating the impacts on viral loads and their infectivity, uh, which is really the a topic of interest uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and just to summarize briefly, some of these technologies that are being put into products and coatings and materials include variety of antimicrobial chemicals. Then there are metals, including copper, zinc, uh, and silver in various formulations. There are antimicrobial polymers that have been developed, and sometimes they include things like the quaternary ammonium compounds, the disinfectants that Anne will be talking more about later. They include combinations of nanometals in polymers, that is, nanoformulations of silver, copper, and zinc sometimes put together. But the point, the bottom line is that in healthcare settings so far, the efficacy in uh, reducing healthcare acquired infections has simply not yet been shown with these technologies that are being used in products, coatings, and materials. Now, I'm concerned that, or I, I'm aware that, COVID-19 may actually increase pressure on manufacturers to begin to expand the use of these technologies more generally in furnishings in our homes and other uh, community settings. I don't think we know uh, what direction that is going to take, and I, I know we don't know what their efficacy will be. Uh, this could be used as a marketing opportunity for manufacturers. It's possible that it will be entirely customer driven, people who are trying to uh, take any steps that they can that might help reduce risk. I hope that it will, it will be data driven, whatever direction this takes meaning that we'll want to look at their efficacy. Not only do they reduce the viral load on surfaces, but do they actually reduce the
the likelihood of infection, which is really what we're trying to accomplish. Are they safe? Are they safe to people uh, who are around uh, these? Are they safe to workers? And what happens if they get out into the environment? And then what is their durability? If we use these technologies and products, how long do they last? Uh, do, they, do they last for a period of time that really makes them useful? Or do they lose their uh, potency uh, quickly, uh, creating a false sense of security? So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And I've given you my contact information for anyone who might want to follow up. Thank you.